Let's close our eyes for prayer. A great God in heaven, we thank you for our gathering together tonight. Thank you for our young people, our children, our students, and thank you for the adults, the parents as well. I pray, Lord, we'll have a good time together tonight. In Jesus' name, we pray, Lord, you'll pass your love into our hearts, and then we'll pass it on to other people. Bless us in our study together today. Enrich our lives in the study of your word. In Jesus' name, we pray. We are grateful to the Lord for the progress we are making in the study of the word of God. At present, we are in First Peter. And we are now in First Peter chapter 1. Today, we are looking at verses 22 through to 25. I read verse 22 with you as you open your Bible. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned unpretending love of the brethren see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently that is the main verse in the text we're looking at today actually we're talking about eternal life and christ-like love through the incorruptible seed this epistle of Peter teaches us on how to survive in a hostile world. The Christians to whom Peter wrote were surrounded by persecutors and they were experiencing hatred and opposition by the, from the unbelieving people around them. The hatred that surrounded them could easily have influenced them that they will become unloving, unpleasant to other people. And so Peter reminded them, and in reminding them, he's instructing us as well, that we need to love one another in spite of what may be around us. They were scattered in various parts of Asia Minor, and they needed to remember the great experience of the new birth and the necessity of loving God's people, not only loving God's people, loving their neighbors, not even their neighbors alone, but they will love even their enemies living in a foreign land as they did and we living in this place far away from our eternal heavenly home we need to understand that we ought to love one another in fact love ought to be the central theme the central theme in our lives in each family and in each local church there should be this love of god in the heart of everyone we must also love our neighbors and even our enemies and those that is those who make themselves our enemies children of god actually don't make enemies of others but there are people that make themselves the enemies of the people of god and yet you as a child of god here is the responsibility the lord has given you just to love as you look at the pages of the new testament you'll find that the New Testament is filled with commandments of the Lord to love. For example, it says, Love your enemies and bless them that curse you. Another passage says, A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another. How are we to love one another? As I have loved you. And Christ continued by saying, These things I command you, that you love one another. As you get into the epistles, you'll find the same thing. It says, love thy neighbor as thyself. Love walketh no ill, no evil against his neighbor. And then it says, you love without dissimulation. That means without hypocrisy or pretense. And Romans were told, in Romans were told, be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. Then it says, oh no man anything, only to do this, but to love one another. What are we told in Ephesians? It's to walk in love as Christ also, as love does. Having compassion on one another. Love as brethren. Then in Hebrews we're told that we should let brotherly love continue. That's the context and the background of what we're looking at today. As we look at the teaching of the word of God. Telling us that if we are children of God, we became born again by the love of God. And that love of God will not just leave us in the way he met us, it met us. It will generate and operate the love of God in our hearts. In fact, it says the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Spirit of God. If it is shed abroad in our hearts by the Spirit of God, then we give evidence to it and we actually show that we have that love of God in our hearts. Moving on to other people, passing on to other people. 
We're going to look at three points as we uh, see the study today. Number one, the sincerity of our love. Not just love, not just superficial love. The sincerity of that love. Number two, the source of eternal life. The source of eternal life. And then number three is the seed of life. Please come back to First Peter chapter 1. We're looking at verse 22. First Peter chapter 1. Verse 22, seeing ye have purified your heart, your soul, in obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. You will see that the theme of the text is love. Actually, it mentions love two times in that single verse. Love one another. Let it be sincere love. Let it be unfeigned love. And then it says, you see that you love one another, not only sincerely, but fervently. As we look at other texts in the Bible, in the New Testament especially, you find this uh, theme recurring over and over again in John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35. Here we find the Lord Jesus Christ talking to his own disciples. And if we are disciples of the Lord, he's speaking to us in the same way in what he spoke to them. He said, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another. He says, whatever the old commandment contained, and whatever limitations there might be in that old commandment, a new commandment I give unto you. Because you are entering into a new covenant. And because there is a new life within you. Because you are in Christ. And you become a new creature. Think about it. A new creature. A new covenant. Now a new commandment I give unto you. Which goes side by side. With the grace of God that has worked in your heart. And it says that ye love one another. And then it tells us the measure of that love. As I have loved you that ye also love one another. And then he tells us it's the evidence by which they will know that we actually belong to the Lord. Coming to church, reading the Bible, praying, giving testimony, and carrying on a lot of things. Having badges on our vehicles, on our homes, everywhere. That doesn't show we love the Lord. That doesn't show we belong to the Lord. There is just one evidence that will prove that we belong to the Lord in verse 35 by this. That is this love, Christ-like love. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to the other. And then in John chapter 15, verse 17. John chapter 15, verse 17. These things I command you, not an advice, not a suggestion, if we're members of the family of God. And if we are partaking of the grace of God, it says, if you will accept the authority of Christ upon your life, if he is your Savior and Lord, as your Lord, as your Master, he has the right to command you. And once the commandment is given to us, these things command you that ye love one another. And so we must not uh, play with uh, this kind of a theme or this kind of subject. It's very, very important. In fact, it is by that text, by that heavy of love that we can actually tell we belong to the Lord in uh, Romans chapter 12 verses 9 and 10 Romans 12 verse 9 let love be without dissimulation that means let it be without hypocrisy it means let it be without pretense it means let it be not superficial it is not to be unfeigned love let it be without dissimulation let it be sincere. Let it be coming from the heart. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love. And then it says in honor, preferring one another. In honor, preferring one another. And then we're told in First John, First John chapter 4. In First John chapter 4, uh, actually, John uh, talks much about love. In fact, it has been said that Peter has been an apostle of hope. And uh, Paul, the apostle of faith. And then John, the apostle of love. But it is so very interesting that even the apostle of hope and the apostle of faith, that is both Peter and Paul, they emphasize the same thing that John emphasized, which is the love of God. Because it's so very central, it is emphasized by everyone in First John chapter 4, reading from verse 7. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, 
For love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. It says, this is the way you are going to know you are born again. This is the evidence you are going to have. You are really a child of God. You are born into the kingdom. The new birth has really taken place in your life, and you are beloved of the Lord. It says, we we'll love one another. Because love is of God. Everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. In verse 8, he that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. He may know the scriptures, but he, not, he doesn't know God. He may know the church, but he doesn't know God. He may lo know a lot of things, a lot of people, but he doesn't know God. If there is no love there, it is the one acid test. That shows whether we have God or we do not have God. In fact, John says it point blank. He says, he that loveth not, knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifest the love of God toward us. Because that uh, God sent his only begotten son into this world that we might live through him. Here in his love. Not that we love God. But that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He's telling us something there that love is not passive. Love is not just quiet. Love is not just something hidden in the heart saying, well, I love everybody with all my heart. They may not see any action. No, it cannot be true. Because if we actually love, there will be action. It is not passive, but it is active. That's why it continues in that same chapter 4, reading from verses 20 and 21. Now, if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. Can you see that? A man says, I love God, but then he hates the children of God. He hates the people that are members of the same spiritual family. It says that cannot be true. If a man say, I love God, and he hates his brother, hates his sister, is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? This is the commandment that we have from him, that he who loveth God, loveth his brother also. Please understand, the word brother there includes your neighbor, includes everyone, all the people around you. He who says he actually loves God will love his neighbor as well. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, be all of one mind. Have compassion of one another. Love as brethren. And be pitiful and courteous. It says we love as brethren. We love as the children of God. We love not as the people of the world. We love not in the limitation of the love of the people of the world. But we love as the brethren. We love as the people that have tasted of the grace of God. We love as the people that have tasted, that have been partakers of the nature of God. And you know what the nature of God is? It's the nature of love. And if that nature of love, the nature of God is in you, you're going to manifest that love and you're going to show that you actually belong to the Lord and then you're going to love not as the people of the world, not even in the limitation of the love we read about in the Old Testament, but you will love as brethren that have been cleansed and washed in the blood of the Lamb. And the love of God, the love of Christ, has been actually transferred into your very heart. In first Peter, Peter, first Peter chapter 4, reading from verses 8 and 9, and above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. Among all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover a multitude of sins. You know what that is saying? It's saying that as we live together, you will see quite a lot of things because we don't reason the same way, we don't think the same way, we don't even act the same way. There are some things you feel that are wrong, but others will feel there is nothing wrong in them. They feel they are innocent things that they are doing. And you think the thing is deadly wrong, seriously wrong. It it says you will cover those faults you will overlook those faults because it says above all have not ordinary charity extraordinary charity not just a superficial charity deep sincere deep-seated heart charity among yourselves you are living together you are working together you are friends together you are business partners together let there be that fervent charity among you then it says how do we know that that charity is there 
How do we know that that love is there? It says that love, that charity, will cover a multitude of sins. You understand? It's not saying that, uh, you know, when somebody commits adultery, cover it up. When somebody commits, uh, you know, steals, cover it up. It's talking about our relationship. Some things that get wrong in our relationship that the other fellow acts innocently. The other fellow does something, but it appears to offend you, injure you. And to you, it's a sin. To him, it's just an ordinary sin that he does. And it says we are going to overlook all those things, the faults and the mistakes and the, and the things that, you know, you, you call offense. For charity, that is a godly kind of love, will cover the multitude of sins. And then in verse 9, it says, use hospitality one to another without grudging. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. Uh, when you grudge, it means that uh, the smoke is still there. It means that the fume is still there. It means that although you might not talk, you might not even act in any bad way, but within you, the sin is still there. But it says, let the grudge, all the grudges, let everything pass away. And just love everyone sincerely, fervently, and without uh, grudging. We're told in uh, First Thessalonians, in First Thessalonians, there in chapter 3, this theme of love still continues. And it tells us there in First Thessalonians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. And the Lord make you increase and abound in love one to another. Maybe you say, well, I don't think I need to study this afresh. I already have the love. And even everybody around you may be able to testify. Yes, it's a loving brother. It's a loving sister. But you know what? The Spirit of God is saying, that's not enough. Let the Lord himself make you increase and abound in love one to another and toward all men as we do toward you. It says whatever level of love we have arrived at now, we have reached now, is not enough. In the home, that love is not enough. In the church, that love is not enough. And all around us, it says that love is not enough. Let it increase, let it abound. And then it says to the end, that he may establish your heart unblameable in holiness. It's not bringing the theme and the text of holiness into the love. It's telling us it's not the sentimental, fleshly kind of love they profess in the world. This one is pure. This one is holy. This one is sacred. And it says, you'll be unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Before I move on to another point, I need to emphasize something. That uh, the Lord, when he spoke to the church uh, at Ephesus, look at Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, reading there in verse 4, it says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. If you look at uh, this church, you'll see many commendable things, wonderful things that Jesus said about them. In fact, he said from verse 2, I know thy works, and I know thy labor, and I know thy patience, and how thou canst not bear with them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which said they are apostles, and are not, and have found them liars, and are born, and have patience, and for my name's sake, has labored, and has not fainted. And you know, those were good qualities, and those are the kind of good qualities we want to maintain in our church. We don't want false doctrine. We don't want false prophets. We don't want just anybody, any dick and hurry to come on our pulpit and just uh, be saying something. We want the people to believe in sound doctrine. That's good. But you know, you can hold on to sound doctrine and miss out on love. And that's what happened to uh, the people in Ephesus. It says that they held on to sound doctrine. They will not allow even the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. But then it says, Jesus said, nevertheless, with all the good points you have, I have somewhat against you because you have led your first love. And as we're looking at the love of God in the heart of the child of God today, maybe you want to begin to examine yourself. Am I still keeping that love of God or is the love of God lost out in my life? If it is, do you know why? Sometimes it's because they're two friends. They love one another. They have been children of God. But then they begin to do business together. And there is accusation now that one is cheating the other. And there is suspicion. And we are sending CID among uh, our friends to examine them little by little. There is no love anymore. Only suspicion as we deal with one another. 
Maybe that's the reason the Lord is telling us that we have lost our first love. Or is it because our sisters, you are living together? And because you are living together, uh, there has been some disagreement and misunderstanding. And we seem to have settled it. Uh, sister, say sorry to our sister. I am sorry. And you say, I forgive. Yes, I forgive. But even after that time, the smoke is still within. We have not totally forgiven. We are now more careful. We are now more reserved. We are no more frank. We are no more open with one another. That's what Jesus is saying. He's saying that's not the kind of love he wants. He wants a frank, open love that is like that of Christ. Or it may be husband and wife. You remember when you first got married or you loved one another. But then of late now, the oil of love is drying out. And the engine of marriage is about to knock. And if we're not careful, that vehicle of marriage or the family will be grounded because of the conflict, because of the false accusation, and because of the things we bottle in the heart against one another. That's what the Lord is telling us. He's saying, uh, let all those things come out today so that there will be no friction. All the false information that you've been getting from your uh, informants about your husband, about your wife, Get rid of everything and let love come back without dissimulation. Or it may be some of these are young people are students. Actually, young people are innocent. They are very friendly. They express their friendship. Uh, sometimes they can even go too far. But then uh, they begin to hear some lies about one another. Ah, uh, you don't know uh, what so-and-so is saying about you. Some gossiping, backbiting is going on. And those things, they begin to knock heads together. They begin to turn their backs on one another. And they begin to... To make enemies of one another. That's what the Lord is saying. He's saying get rid of all those things. All the bad, bad things we have been hearing. That makes us now to hate that brother. Not to love that brother. Get rid of everything. Is it master and servant? And uh, when that boy, when he first came. When that maid, when she first came. How you loved him, how you loved her. And in fact, you remember when you told him, when you told her, I make you like one of my children. I love you so much. And in fact, if it were not because you'll need to get your freedom and go and walk in and go and walk on your own, I would have kept you with me even for life. You loved him so much. But now some people have been telling you, he's stealing your money. His stay is uh, getting the customers away. And that has now been in your heart. And because of that, there is no love anymore. Every time you see that boy, you see that girl, it's like there is hatred in your heart. You just see him like this. If you were laughing before, if you were joyful before, all the joy is gone. Because that uh, boy, that girl now, is a kind of a source of sorrow for you. Or it may be in our midst, uh, you know, deeper life of those days were just simple-hearted believers. And uh, we didn't uh, concentrate on dreams. But I see that uh, many people today, dreams have taken over our lives. If anybody had a dream that he saw the appearance of an oppressor, an appearance of somebody doing something to him in the dream, he wakes up in the morning, he doesn't understand that Satan can play tricks. He doesn't understand that Satan can become an angel of light, transform himself to an angel of light to try to deceive. I saw sister so-and-so. They call her women rep or they call her house fellowship leader. I saw brother so-and-so. Uh, they call him uh, whatever. And uh, you see now, I saw him in the dream. And then we begin to hate one another, avoid one another. And uh, if we're in the retreat, we are supposed to eat together. We cannot eat together because, uh, you know, I suspect him. He has another power there's an evil personality behind him hatred malice because of the dream and the brother has done nothing and the sister has done nothing or it may be in this uh, time we're living now uh, we owe one another debt uh, you know uh, i had a need and then i go to the brother i said can you be of help to me and then he tried to help me and i'm making and trying my best to pay him back but uh, i have not been able to make ends meet and because i'm not been able to pay him and you know i said brother please be patient with me i will pay you and then uh, first of all he said okay okay and i went the other time again please be patient with me ah this patience, patience we are talking about, uh, please, uh, we're human, patience is running out, please hurry up. And then eventually I go to him again, I, I, I thought I would settle this in this month, and uh, I'm telling you that I'm sorry, I'm not able to settle again. And then he tells me, point blank, I'm telling you now, 
I used to love you, I don't love you anymore. I used to believe you, I don't believe you anymore. I think you are deceiving me. I think, uh, you know, you are playing tricks on me. Because we're not able to pay, because we're not able to give back what we owe, hatred has come, malice has come, and a lot of infighting in the house of God has come. But the Lord is calling us back to come back to love. If we will love one another, whatever it is we have lost as a result of our relationship together, God will repay us in Jesus. Jesus name but you see the love that we're talking about is not a kind of a passive love as I said before it is active love it is love that does something look at it in a first John chapter 3 first John chapter 3 reading there from verse 16 hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren not only lay down your time for the brethren and care for them not only lay your property down for the brethren and uh, care for them not only you students lend your books uh, you know to those uh, who need them or uh, your notes to those who need them not only that even our very lives that we ought to lay down our lives to, for the brethren that means we'll be willing to share our little children have some little little things they can share we who are adults the parents we have some other things greater than what our students have that we can share let us share don't uh, eat all your food alone uh, wear all your clothes alone and you, you spend everything that you have alone care for one another it says but whoso has this world's good and seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his powers of compassion from him how dwelleth the love of god in him my little children let us not love in word neither in tongue but in deed and in truth indeed and in truth it's telling us there that uh, our love must be very practical what does that mean it means we're going to serve one another it means we're going to do good to one another it means whenever we offend one another because we will offend one another it means we're going to forgive and forget it means we're going to care for one another help one another it means we're going to assist one another you see that uh, your brother has burden your brother has something he cannot deal with you bear one another's burden and it means we're going to pray for one another it means we're going to uh, visit one another you're going to protect the people that are in danger and if you see the danger coming and they do not see it you will warn them of the danger ahead of them you will encourage one another you will comfort one another you'll be considerate about one another how important that is in our families in our homes that the husband will be considerate of the wife that the parents will be considerate of the children that were considerate of one another it means we're going to teach one another you see that the brother he doesn't have the knowledge you ought to have and you have the knowledge teach him lead him in the way of the truth it means we're going to act friendly even the little little things ordinary greetings some people you know they, they are so consumed with themselves and they are so inward looking they cannot even greet other people it means we're going to trust one another when we don't trust one another there will be no love there will be suspicion it means to show concern to one another it means you are compassionate to one another it means you'll feed the hungry if somebody hungry and and die of uh, dying of hunger uh, uh, around you you will bring out what you have feed the hungry you know what it means to love one another you are going to seek the best for one another and of one another you'll not be seeking the downfall of the other person you'll not be seeking the poverty and the defeat of the other fellow you seek the best of one another and you try to meet the needs of other people what does the bible say it says you rejoice sincerely with those who rejoice and you will weep with those who are weeping and then it means that all this gossiping all this backbiting is going to stop because you see if we're gossiping about one another you are saying bad bad things about one another when that brother hears when that uh, sister hears he's not going to be happy you're going to destroy his very his very life 
and then you have mutual respect for one another i respect you you respect me the brothers respect the sisters the sisters respect the brothers and we respect one another we live in peace and we are peacemakers and uh, we stand by one another uh, the, the police have come and they have taken a brother and uh, he didn't know head or tail of what they are accusing him about everybody will not just forsake him and say well let him look to it this time you cannot tell you it's a brother it's not a brother i'm not going to waste my time going to them if they set him free all right if they don't set him free let him look to that we're going to stand by one another in times of difficulty please come back to first peter chapter one First Peter chapter 1, in verse 22, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned and pretending love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart, uh, fervently. Actually, Peter here is using two Greek words. Uh, one is Philadelphia, which just means, uh, you know, you love one another, you are kind to one another, all those things I told you. And then the other one is agape. That one is sacrificial love. It's telling us then that uh, the kind of love we ought to have with one another, number one, it's sincere. Number two, it is sacrificial. Number three, it's sound, sacred kind of love that is coming out of a pure heart. And we love one another fervently. We go to point number two, which is the source of eternal life. The source of eternal life. In First Peter chapter 1, verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. He says we should be able to love one another. Are we not born again? Are we not children of God? He says, see that you love one another fervently. And then he says, I put that on the basis, on the foundation, that you are born again. In verse 23, being born again. And we're born again, not of corruptible seed. We're born again of the incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And here Peter turns to the doctrine of the new birth. Because it is this new birth which actually makes us the children of God. And makes us brethren in the same family. And here is the Christian's highest privilege. That's why John the Beloved said, Behold, what manner of law the Father has bestowed upon us that we shall be called the children or the sons of God were begotten again of the incorruptible seed. That is the word of God. And that word of God, which is the source of our spiritual life, is working in us, is operating in us. If you have experienced that new birth, it means you have experienced the forgiveness of the Lord, the cleansing of the Lord, the regeneration of the Lord. Through Christ's redemptive work, through the precious blood of the Lamb. And that, uh, that was shed for our redemption and salvation. And yet, you know, the word of God plays an important part in our salvation. Isn't it the word of God that makes us to know we have sinned? Isn't it the word of God that makes us we know that we cannot save our life ourselves? Isn't it the word of God that makes us to know that Jesus Christ, he went to the cross and he died for us? Isn't it the word of God that makes us to know whosoever shall call upon his name shall be saved? Isn't it the word of God that makes us to know is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God through him? And so that is why it says we are born again by the word of God. And uh, the word of God, the Bible uses some kinds of symbolism, symbols uh, for the word of God. It uses water, for example, as a symbol of the word of God. In John chapter 3, John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then to expatiate and explain, amplify it more, he said in verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water. That's a symbol for the word of God. Born of the word of God and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It is very important that we are born again. And as we are born again, it is the word of God that quickens us, that makes us alive, that gives us eternal life and through that we have the promise of eternal life we're able to lay hold on the promise of the lord in john chapter 6 john chapter 6 verse 63 it is the spirit that quickness the flesh profiteth nothing 
the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. When you allow that word to work in your life, it quickens you, it makes you alive, it gets you saved, it gives you spiritual resurrection. And if you have been born again, but you are becoming cold and lukewarm and lethargic, it is when you hear the word of God again that comes in you again, that refreshes you and revives you and brings a new life again by the quickening power that breathes upon that word of God. It is this word of God then which is the instrument of the new birth. It is this word of God which is the instrument of the new life. And it is this word of God which is the instrument of our growth in the spiritual life. That's why the word of God, the word of God is so important. And as children of God, we need to read the word of God every time. And what you read, you will analyze, you will apply it to yourself. You will make sure you are not just reading it to have it in the head. It's down deep in your heart. And every time it's working in your heart, working in your life, by the operation of the Spirit of God. In James chapter 1 verse 18. James 1 verse 18. He tells us of his own will. Begat ye us with the word of truth. Here is it again. It is a word of truth. You know the truth and then you are set free. You are set free from your sin. You are set free from your bondages as well. In uh, John chapter 15, the words of Jesus telling us how we are cleansed, how we remain clean. When you take in the word of God every day, you study the word of God every day, you do not allow a day to pass without getting into the word. It is that word that keeps you clean, keeps on cleansing you every time. In John chapter 15 verse 3, now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. And when you hear that word, you may hear it in cassette, you may hear it directly, and you may hear it uh, as you read the word of God for yourself, as you read the Christian books that explain, that apply the word of God to your life, then you are being constantly kept clean by the word of God. This word of God is called a seed. It is a seed of life, and it is that seed within you that keeps you away from sin and keeps your life clean and keeps your life pure. In uh, First John chapter three, First John chapter three, reading there in verse nine, whosoever is born of God, we're still talking about the new birth. And it's a great privilege to be born again. And when we're born again, born of God, whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. How is it he does not commit sin? Is he so strong that he is not committing sin? It's not because he's strong, but there's something within him that is strong. And he cannot sin because he's born of God. And then he said, for his seed remaineth in him. When the seed remains in you, that's the word of God. Then it makes you to actually uh, be able to stand, be able to resist temptation. Because the word of God is always reminding you, no, you can't do that. That's, uh, that's what a child of God will not do. That's the way of the people of the world. You will not live like the Gentiles. The word of God is ever present with you, telling you how to walk and where to go and how to move and, and the way to do things. In the Psalm 119, Psalm 119. Verses 9 and 11, 9 to 11. Wherewith that shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Do you see the importance of the word? How do you cleanse your way? How do you remain clean in this dirty world in which we are? By taking heed according to thy word. It says, With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments, because those are the commandments that act as a control, that act as check, as restraint over my life, and then the commandments will not allow me to go into areas and territories that are evil. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. And then as you are saved and you are living that clean life, then you understand you need to be sanctified. How do you know about that sanctification? Again, it's the word of God. In fact, Jesus Christ said in his prayer, the high priestly prayer in uh, John chapter 17 from verse 17. It says, sanctify them, purify them, make them holy, entire, through and through. It says, sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. 
if we want to be sanctified, if we want the Adamic nature to be taken away, if we want uh, that thing, uh, the root of sin there to be uprooted, if we want uh, the, the hand of the Lord to reach down deep into the very nature of our lives and take away that thing that will raise up its ugly head if it's not uh, dealt with, if we want the Lord to actually remove the heart of stone and give us the heart of flesh, we need the word of God. It's the power in that word. That, that brings uh, that holiness in our lives in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25 Ephesians 5 verse 25 husbands love your wives how even as Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for it that he might do what sanctify and cleanse it or the washing of water by the word the water there is the word it says that he might cleanse you that he might sanctify you that everything that uh, the fall of adam brought into your heart and it's your nature that the lord himself he has the ability he has the divine power to reach down deep into your very nature and take everything away and cleanse you and sanctify you and circumcise you and make you holy and purify and purge your nature that he might present unto himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The word of the Lord does a lot of things in our lives. And I pray that uh, you will give the Holy Ghost a chance to operate by the word of God and to do a deeper, greater work in your heart and life in Jesus' name. We come to point number three, the siege of life. The siege of life. We're looking at First Peter chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 23 now to verse 25. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The flower withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Here he tells us now about the seed. Uh, those who are familiar with farming, they understand you take the seed, you plant it. It is then the plant will grow up and the flowers and the fruit and everything. And that's what the Lord is saying. In fact, he told the parable of the sower of the seed. Uh, telling us that uh, the word of God is a seed. It's like the seed that the farmer takes and then he plants in the heart. And when he plants it in the heart, then it brings forth a fruit. In Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 from verse 1 and then we'll jump on to verse uh, 15. Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8 verse 15. It says there that, uh, but that on the good ground are they. Which uh, in an honest heart and good heart, uh, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. It's talking about uh, the word of God there. And it says uh, there that when you hear the word of God, and that word of God gets into your heart like the seed gets into the ground. Then you understand it's going to be a fruit. And it tells us in verse 11, it says now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. And so you understand, when that seed comes into your heart, it bears fruit. And when it bears fruit, it makes you then not to be a person that will not that will just be living the life as if uh, something has not been done in your heart by the power, by the hand of the Lord. But he tells us in First Peter, it says uh, the glory of man, it will fall up like a flower of the grass. And that man himself will wither away. He will not continue forever in this life like the grass itself. Actually, Peter was quoting that. He was making allusion to Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 40, you find a parallel passage. Isaiah chapter 40, reading from verse 6 all through to verse 8. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass. And all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass, the grass withereth, and the flower fadeth. But the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. 
the word of the Lord will stand forever. But you see the grass, it will fail. That means then no matter what man is, no matter what man does, no matter what man achieves, that man will soon fade away. But there is something that will never fade away. There is something that will never perish. That is the word of God. That's why it says that word of God abideth forever. And aren't you fortunate that God has revealed himself unto you? He has revealed this word unto you. Although the people of the world, they may be with the things that will fade away, the things that will pass away. But here we are. We have the things that will never fail. The thing that will never lose its power. We're told of uh, the ministry of the word in uh, Psalm 119. Psalm 119. We look at verse 89. It says, Forever, O Lord. Thy word is settled in heaven. The word of the Lord is settled in heaven. Man may come and go. The glories of men may come and go. And the things that we see in the world, they are there today, they are not there tomorrow. But then it says, the word of God is different. All those things, whether the gold or the silver or the beauty of this age or the things that we see, it's like they are corruptible things. But there is something that is incorruptible. That's the thing that remains forever. That's why it says forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. What does that word do in our lives, in our hearts? It says in 105, verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. It says the word will never leave you. The word is always there. And the word will be a shining light unto you so that you will not stumble in life and other people too will not stumble upon you. Uh, I read uh, the, the, the story of a blind man. He was uh, walking uh, around in the night. And then he had a lantern in his hand. And then uh, somebody approached him and said, You are a blind man. Why are you carrying a lantern? After all, you cannot see by the lantern. He said, Yes, I'm carrying it so that people who see will see the lantern and they will not stumble on me. That's the word of God. The word of God, it will not make you to stumble. That's number one. It will not allow other people to stumble on you as well. That's why, why we carry that word of God. We live by that word of God. In verse 130 of that same psalm, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding to the simple. And naturally, by nature, we are foolish. By nature, we do not know much. But it is the word of God that gives us wisdom. It's the word of God that uh, gives us understanding. It's the word of God that guides us in the crossroads of life uh, so that we do not make uh, dangerous mistakes that will destroy and ruin our lives. In Second Timothy, Second Timothy chapter 3, verses uh, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable. Profitable for what? For doctrine and for reproof, and for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. You see, in our lives, even after we are saved, uh, there, there will still be a lot of things we do not know. We may have a good heart, but we do not have a perfect brain, a perfect mind. And therefore, in the crossroads of life, there will be difficulties. And then it is that word of God, inspired by the Spirit of God, very, very profitable for the Christian life. Very profitable to be able to stand firm on the word of God. Very, very profitable to make you to be walking in righteousness all the days of your life. And it's good for doctrine. And it's good for reproof. When you have done something wrong, then the word of God will come and rebuke you and reprove you and say, but you are born again, but you are a child of God. How is it you are walking in that path? Then you feel sorry. It's that not same word of God that goes, that makes you go on your knees and you confess everything to the Lord, and then it brings correction, it brings instruction in righteousness. Why is the word of God doing that in our lives? Reproving us, and teaching us, and instructing us, and correcting us in verse 17. That the man of God may be perfect. It is to perfect us. It's to develop us. It's to mature us. It's to make us grow up through a uh, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It is so that you will not just be limited to the little, little things you are doing now, but the word of God will continue to operate and work in your life until you are thoroughly furnished and perfected unto all good works. In Psalm 19, Psalm 19, reading there in uh, verses 7 to 11, here we are still being told of the ministry of the word of God in our lives. Psalm 19 from verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, 
the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It is still the word of God. It calls it by different titles. The law of God or the, or the testimony of the Lord is the same thing. It's converting the soul. It changes the soul. It, it transforms the soul. It turns you in the right direction. And the testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. Then you say the statutes of the Lord are right. Rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. Righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold yea. Than much fine gold sweeter also than honey. And the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned. It's in the word of God we have warning. It's in the word of God we are told to flee from the judgment to come. And then it says in keeping them, there is great reward. I pray that this word of God, which the Lord himself has given us, will never leave our lives in Jesus' name. And will continue to profit by the ministry of the word in Jesus' name. In First Peter now, chapter 1, verse 25. First Peter 1 verse 25 But the word of the Lord endureth forever. He says, all the things of this world will pass away. In fact, they are passing away already. And they are fading off already. They do not keep their beauty, their charm, and their brilliance anymore. They are fading away. But it says there is something that will never fade away. There is something that will never pass away. That is the word of God. As, as you read the word of God, you discover that yourself. Number one, is perennially fresh. Every time you take the word of God, you read it before, you are reading it again, it's perennially fresh. Number two, it is, it never becomes obsolete. Think about it. This is the same word of God that people, men of God, we have heard about of hundreds of years ago that they read and it uh, saved them, it uh, helped them. We are reading it today and it has never become obsolete. Number three, it is indestructible because this word of God endureth forever. Number four, it is life given. You read the word of God, it brings eternal life to you. It makes you to have the life of God, the life of Christ in you. Number five, it cleanses out the old life and begets the new life. You read the word of God and it's doing something. Every time you come here on Monday or every time you, you, you listen to the word of God, it doesn't leave you the way it meant you before. Uh, you know, somebody preacher was uh, getting discouraged and then he said that, uh, well, uh, I don't see the, the use of the word of God because uh, I preached the word of God and I asked the woman, I said, uh, what did you gain in the last, uh, in the last service? And the woman just replied, I forgot and then the man said oh god this is what i'm telling you these people they do not retain the word of god and then eventually uh, she saw he saw a woman coming from the uh, riverside and they peed some vegetables and the vegetables had some dirty uh, kind of dust on it and the woman poured water on it poured water on it poured water on it uh, remember the vegetable was in the basket and the basket did not retain any water and then the preacher saw something. Although the basket did not retain the water, the vegetables were clean. That the passing in of the word of God like water is cleansing you every time. Although you may not remember every reverence, although you may not remember everything was said, whether you remember or you do not remember, that word of God is working silently. It is changing your life. It is producing fruit. And you will never be the same in Jesus' name. Number six, it produces a living faith. A living faith in you. What does the Bible say? It says that faith coming by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Do you see you have more faith today than you had many years ago? You know why? Because you have been hearing the word of God. Number seven, it is life sustaining. That is, it is a spiritual food that sustains our spiritual life. Number eight, it is life transforming. Having the power to renew us. Number nine, it is a primary agent of spiritual growth and maturity. If you want to grow, read your Bible and pray every day. We we'll sing it among our young people. Adults need it too. Number 10, it gives us light and guidance. Number 11, it uh, makes us victorious over the enemy of our soul. Uh, because this is the sword of the spirit by which you will defeat the devil. Number 12, it is a source of revelation, truth, and eternal happiness. And then Peter says this. 
is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. All that you have heard, this is the word you are hearing. And this is what it will do in your life. I pray that as you come every time and you read the word in your own home every time, it will keep on working in your life until it transports you to heaven in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and we're going to pray and we're going to talk to the Lord. We thank the Lord for what he's teaching us. We thank the Lord for his word. We thank him because of this word which is always bearing fruit in our lives. Please rise up. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Remember we are to love one another. Remember we are to have fervent love among one another. What's the reason for your love growing cold? You don't love your fellow brother anymore. Your fellow sister anymore. Your husband anymore the way you used to love him. Your wife anymore the way you used to love her. Your children anymore be the way you used to love them. Members of the church the way you were excited. When we saw one another you are no more exactly like that anymore. Love one another. Love one another. Let's forget the past. Let's move on in the love of the Lord. Love one another. And the seed of the word bringing life in us continue to study. Don't miss the study of the word of God. Always come and the Lord will do you good.